Thank you so much for watching VivaTheLife.com. My name is Lou Viva, so I'm here today with a really good friend of mine, Brandon Thorpe, the Vice President of First Alliance Home Mortgage. Thank you, Lou, for having me here with the Viva The Life team. Look forward to the, uh, the time with you. Now, before a person goes and looks for a home, they have to do something very, very important, which is to get a pre-approval. Now, they often get instead a pre-qualification letter. Could you tell us the difference between a pre-approval and a pre-qualification letter? That's a great question, Lou. So the difference between a pre-qualification and a pre-approval is this. A pre-qualification is when someone would call a bank or speak to a loan officer, have an initial conversation with them, and share certain pieces of information. But nothing's really reviewed in depth. Mm -hmm. From that conversation alone, then that loan officer or that bank would then issue what's called a pre-qualification letter. Okay? There's really not a lot of substance to it, to be honest with you. The pre-approval letter, however, is an in-depth look at the credit, income, and most likely the assets of the borrower, making sure that they are qualified up to a certain amount. So when they go to look with you, the realtor, they're all set. Now, when a person's trying to get a pre-approval letter, what are the documents that they need to bring to you? It's a great question. Depending upon how the person is employed, for example, a normal W-2 employee will need two of their most recent pay stubs, their W-2s from their most recent two years, and the most recent two years taxes, all pages. For someone who is self-employed, then they wouldn't have W-2s or pay stubs per se. However, they may have a 1099 form that we would need for the last two years and definitely their two years taxes as well. That way we're able to fully review their income. In addition to that, we have to review their credit, which is extremely important. Now, the reason that's such an important step is because with the pre-approval letter, I know how much and the borrower knows or my buyer knows how much they can qualify for and how much of an offer they can make. So then it's my turn to go out and take you as a buyer out to as many properties as we see within that particular criteria of what you're looking for and what the price range is. Now, once we find the property that you're looking for, we're going to make the offer. We sit down um, probably here at the office and, uh, and write it out. And the offer hopefully gets ratified. The contract goes back to Brandon Thorpe. Now, Brandon, tell us what happens when you get the contract. Now, that is officially when the financing process begins. Mm -hmm. They will sign the application. I will review everything with them. Then after that, we go through the steps of the home buying process. Now that they have a ratified contract, what I do is actually meet with the borrower in person to review everything. Okay, let's go over all of your initial documents one more time. Let's talk about the entire purchase process from A to Z. Let's make sure that you're totally comfortable and all of your questions are answered. And now just to um, cover something like a basic uh, thing about uh, mortgages, uh, I know that when a person is, is getting ready to <clears throat> purchase a property, they should understand the term, the acronym PITI. Could you go over that for us? Absolutely. That's one of the most important parts in terms of the borrower and his or her family. PITI stands for Principal, Interest, Taxes, and Insurance. Okay. So the actual mortgage payment itself is principal and interest. The T and the I, the taxes and insurance, are what goes to the county or the state and then also for their hazard insurance, i.e. State Farm, Allstate, or something like that. However, for individuals who are buying a condo or if they're buying a townhouse and there's a homeowners association, there's separate fees there as well, which are not paid to the bank, but are paid separately and they need to be cognizant of those as well. All right, great. So now once the, like, like I said, once the offer is ratified, it goes to Brandon and, uh, and, and then the next step after uh, Brandon takes care and begins the loan process is uh, the, the next big hurdle is the home inspection. During the home inspection, now I have an amazing home inspector that I often refer to someone, but obviously anyone can pick whatever home inspector they want. So open up the phone book or go to uh, Google, whatever. Uh, but, but once we go um, and, and do the home inspection, it's an opportunity for you as a borrower or the buyer to renegotiate the contract depending on what we find. Now, if the property is in excellent condition, there's nothing to renegotiate. But if we find significant problems, we can go back and maybe have them contribute more to, to correcting the problem or lowering the price some. So after we've dealt with the home inspection, yes. the next big step that usually uh, happens is the termite inspection. Mm -hmm. And after that, the appraisal. Brandon, please tell us about the appraisal. Yes, so the appraisal is one of the milestones in the home buying process. In fact, it's one of the most important parts of it uh, besides the actual underwriting approval. What happens is this. I will order the appraisal, or my company will order the appraisal for the borrower. The appraiser will contact you directly in order to get access to the home. 
what the appraiser does in terms of determining the value of the property is looking at what's called comps or comparable properties within a mile to a mile and a half radius, homes that are very similar to the property that they want to purchase, look at how much they have sold for. They will use that value to help determine the value of the home that they want to buy. Now, in most cases, the best case scenario, should I say, is that the home value okay, is equivalent to the contract price. Then we don't have any issues. If the, the appraised value is in excess, great. They will buy a home with some built-in equity. If the appraised value is a little bit less, then we're going to have to revisit the contract because as a lender, we're going to require that the buyer bring that extra money to closing. But working with you, I'm sure that we could work something out to make sure that doesn't happen. After the hurdle of the appraisal has, has been passed, uh, then it's time for uh, Brandon to do his magic with his underwriter. Please tell us about that. Sure. So the underwriting process is this. Essentially, um, I, in a sense, pre-underwrite the file as a loan officer. Mm -hmm. I look at all of the documents that we spoke about earlier in terms of their income, assets, credit, etc. I do an initial thorough review of those. Put the entire loan package together, then it's sent before the underwriter. So what the underwriter does is this. He or she will verify everything that I have, as a loan officer, have done in the beginning. Looking at the income, looking at the credit, looking at the assets, looking at the appraisal, as we discussed, looking at what's called title, something that we'll talk about a little bit later. Once the underwriter has reviewed all those things and issued an approval, and we've worked through any questions that the underwriter may have, then the loan will be cleared for closing. It will go to the closing department, then the closing department will contact you and the settlement agent to get everything set up for closing. Once the uh, underwriting process is ready to go and the loan has been approved, that's when we settle. Now, an important thing that we missed earlier is uh, when we make an offer, depending on how competitive the environment is, you also have to make something called an earnest money deposit. Yes. Now, the earnest money deposit it is, is part of the offer and it goes into the, uh, and, and it actually uh, pays for your, uh, for your, uh, for your closing costs. Can you tell us a little bit? A little yeah, bit so about basically, that? the earnest money deposit can do one of two things. Normally, let's say if someone puts down $5,000 for their earnest money deposit, that will be credited back to them at closing toward their down payment. Okay? If they don't want to do that, then it could be credited to them at closing toward their closing fees. So, Brandon, please tell me what happens at settlement. It's a great question. So, what happens at settlement is this you have the buyers, the sellers, the settlement agent are all there. The most important paper is called a HUD-1 or a settlement sheet. Mm -hmm. Okay, there's two sides to it. There's the buyer side, which is the left side, and the seller side. Essentially, all the HUD-1 does is this. It details all of the closing fees that are part of the loan. It also shows the seller's price. Okay, it shows any credits, as we talked about before, the earnest money deposit, and gives a net amount that the borrower needs to bring to closing. There's another page to the settlement sheet that details the pity payment that we spoke about before. So it gives the, the borrower everything that they need. It shows what their loan amount's gonna be, the final purchase price, all of their closing fees, their monthly payment, their interest rate. Everything they need to know about the loan is on the HUD-1 form that they sign and review at closing. If you have further questions about the loan process, about the mortgage process, please email me directly at lou at vivathelife.com. And we'll make sure to do follow-up videos, frequently asked question videos with Brandon Thorpe. Brandon, thank you so much for joining us. This has been fantastic. Um, this has been great information. I can't wait to see you here at vivathelife.com again. So um, thank you. Thank you. I really appreciate your time. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, thank you so much for watching vivathelife.com.